Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this very special event. My name is Justin Royson, and I'm the co-chair of the Coke John Endowment for Peace and Justice here at St. Ambrose. And it is my pleasure this evening to welcome you to tonight's Joseph O'Connor Labor and Justice Lecture. Um, hopefully you had a chance to join us in the spring when we had Dr. Beth and speak and do an intro day. Get us introduced to Father O'Connor. Um, but our speaker this evening is one you may recognize since he's been seen around these halls for over three decades. Born and raised south of the Locust, as he will be very <laughs> proud to tell you. Tonight's speaker attended all local Catholic schools, then attended St. Ambrose first as a student and then as a professor, attending and graduating from his beloved Notre Dame, even though it's really University of Iowa. <laughs> he taught here for 29 years, and although he retired after this past Christmas, we still haven't had quite enough of him and asked him to come back and continue teaching philosophy again this fall, which he has fiercely, fearlessly done throughout acclimating to his brand new shiny head. <laughs> so, uh, titanium, yes. titanium, it's titanium. <laughs> He's turning into millions, six million dollar man. <laughs> when we wanted to have someone to tell the story of St. Ambrose's legacy in peace and nonviolence, there was unanimous agreement among the endowment committee that the best person to do this is the gentleman sitting right here, my dear friend and colleague, Professor Emeritus, Reverend Father, Doctor, <laughs> Ryan my club. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. When we first hired Jesse to replace Digger Dawson, my job was to take her around the Quad City so I took her to Pat Kennedy's house. Anybody remember Sister Pat Kennedy? Yeah, right. And she was playing bridge and drinking martinis. So I brought Jesse, and the first thing Pat said was, Oh, she's so cute. So a philosopher that's cute. How does that happen? Brighter than that. Kid. Thank you so much for this. Yeah, they dragged me out of retirement. I love this stuff. I just love it. You know, and Ted over here is taking over teaching the course of ethics of peace and nonviolence. This is how I got into it. Um, I first of all play guitar at the federal building downtown with Father Digger Dawson. And uh, my job was to make sure I had all three chords, you know, for we shall overcome. Right? Okay, guitarists understand that. It's funny. Okay, but so that's all I really did. I wasn't into it, but Dawson was so inspiring. I think he lived St. Francis. If you know Digger Dawson, he put it to like personal, he was it. So that was so inspiring, got me going. Um, so uh, uh, the second stage here was that uh, uh, Digger Dawson had a heart, uh, let's see, a little stroke. I think it was like in 1995 after I came back from Notre Dame with my brand new shiny PhD. Um, and and uh, had Father Ed Dunn was standing around and saying, Well, who's going to take that peace court? Go, well, Brian, why don't you take it? And I'm like, oh, Okay. You know, so I had to start thinking, Well, who was Mark Luther King? You know, who was Dorothy? I had to start cramming. So I've been cramming peace and nonviolence for 29 years. It is worth more than the trillion we spend on armaments and training our killers. So I'm glad to be here. I don't know how long. My, my inside feels like I'm 50 and ready to go. My outside feels like I'm 74 between here and the nursing home or the funeral home. So we'll see how long it lasts. Okay. So that was my beginning. Um, and then so I took Father Dawson's text the next day it went into a classroom and you know the second chapter whatever had questions at the end here's one of the questions what would it take to make the border of mexico the same as the border of canada nobody spoke up then somebody spoke up they shouldn't be coming over and taking our stuff and then somebody else said no no they have a right to be. anyhow maybe uh, uh Gimbal, Dr. Gimbal's daughter was sitting there quiet. And I said, Maggie, what do you have? And she goes, you just speak such. She said, you know, you'd have to look at the economy of Mexico. The reason that they're coming in. I'm going, Shh. We almost started World War III in a peace class. So that's my beginning. Okay, 
After that, it became more and more learning. Okay, so now what I want to do with this course is do the Augustinian temporality that got Husserl and Heidegger going, and that is past, present, future, in the present. So the past here is uh, more than anything, it did Father Jack Smith and the Pachin in Paris Award. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. Where did they get that picture? Yeah, okay, then one more. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dan Ebner is here, and, no, and Kathy Kiley. God love him. Um, Kathy's husband died some time ago. He was so central to peacemaking um, at, at St. Ambrose that I asked. Uh, and Dan has to give us the summary of this thing. Seven, ten minutes. <laughs> you got it. Thank you so much, Brother Brian. Uh, so, uh, I enrolled at Ambrose, St. Ambrose College back then, 51 years ago, with the intent of becoming a Catholic priest. My time in the seminary only lasted three semesters, but it completely changed my life. Four priests made all the difference. First, Father Bill Stratton. He was my spiritual advisor and got me involved in everything. As a seminarian, I was visiting the sick at Mercy Hospital, teaching religious ed in the parishes, protesting the war in Vietnam, boycotting lettuce on behalf of the United Farm Workers, visiting the folks at the call home, hanging out at the Black Student Union, serving soup with the Catholic worker, marching for civil rights, visiting the Scott County Jail, leafleting the Duck Creek Mall to free Angela Davis, and debating the social, political, religious, and cultural issues of our day until the wee hours of the night and that was usually around, Father Ross should be glad to know, it was usually around the altar in the chapel at St. Andrews. Um, and of course, going to Mass every day. Now, every once in a while, we did have some time to squeeze in time to go to class. But our real education was happening in all these co curricular activities, right? Priest number two, Father Jack Smith, who later became my mentor and um, an advisor in my first master's degree which was focused on how to teach Catholic social teaching. Jack was often in those late night debates and always in the marches of protests. He taught us to see how history impacts the present and that nonviolence was the only way to ensure that, that social change was lasting change. It was Jack's idea to start the Pachman Terrace Award because he saw the encyclical Pachman Terrace as a life changing event in the Catholic church. My first experience of Potsman Terrace was meeting Dorothy Day, who came here in 1972 to receive the award when I was a student. Afterward, I read all of Dorothy's books, and it completely changed my perspective on politics, poverty, pacifism, and personalism. My wife and I joined the Catholic worker community four years, for four years in Dubuque after I left Ambrose, where we organized the roundtable discussion clarification of thought. When I moved to New York several years after that, I met many people involved in the New York Catholic worker, including Dorothy's best friend, Eileen Egan, who became a mentor of mine while I lived in New York, and whom I later brought to Davenport to receive the Pachman Terrace Award. Priest number three, Father Digger Dawson, who later married me and my wife for the past 45 years. Digger was our campus minister. More than anything, Digger taught me to be joyful. Digger was a model, as Father Brian said, of St. Francis. He was a model of what it meant to live the gospel. He did all the things a priest can do to build community at Ambrose, and he was intricately involved in every one of the activities I mentioned earlier. In 1978, I went with Digger and Jack Smith to New York to march in the first UN special session on disarmament. A few years later, while living in New York, I facilitated the early coalition planning meetings for the second special session on disarmament, when our coalition brought 1.2 million people, that's within him, million people, to march in New York City and to protest nuclear weapons. Priest number four, Father Mar Mai, who I met in the 70s at Ambrose and visited while he, while he lived in Washington, D.C., when Mar was the national director of the Campaign for Human Development. Marv hired me to move back to Davenport in 1986 and assumed the position he started as Diocesan Director 
of social action and Catholic charities. Father Monet was my mentor, my pastor, my spiritual director, my role model, and my friend. Some of my favorite Mark Monet lessons are number one, that voting is only 1% of your political responsibility. Number two, that all politics are local. Number three, that you need to think globally and act locally. Number four, that you need to balance your work for justice with all the works of mercy. And number five, pray that you, uh, you know, that you have to pray like everything is in God's hands, but work like it is all in your hands. Now I know not all those were original to Father Modit, but this one is number six, his most famous teaching that you need both feet to walk. Of course, that was Father Modit's famous two feet of Christian service, charity, and justice, which became a national model. Being back in Davenport gave me the chance to coordinate the Pachman Terrace Award and to bring the presentation of the awards back to the St. Ambrose campus. We awarded 20 recipients during my 20 years as coordinator of this award, including four Nobel Peace Prize winners. Number one, Desmond Tutu, who packed Lee Loman Arena like it's never been packed before or since. Marie Corrigan McGuire, the Irish peacemaker, who had worked in Ireland with the same organization I worked for in New York, the International Fellowship of Reconciliation. Number three, Adolfo Perez Esquivel, the Argentinian human rights worker, whose USA tour I coordinated shortly after he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And number four, Wek Boenza, the union organizer from Poland, who also gave the St. Ambrose commencement that year. One of my favorite Cosmeteris stories, mostly, um, um, was with the 1988, 1998 recipient, Sister Helen Berzheim, packed the St. Ambrose Chapel, mostly with students, and she quipped, now I know that most of you are here to see the nun who was played by Susan Sarandon in the movie Dead Man Walking. Sorry to disappoint you, Sister said, but Susan could not come along. But Sister Helen did not disappoint. She brought the students to their feet. In fact, none of these recipients did. It's been a highlight of my life, and it all goes back to those four priests who I met at St. Ambrose and who forever changed my life. Now, Katie's going to talk a little bit about, about what we're doing with Pachman right now. Yeah. 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 But I bet it works. Every little boy slept. Um, I've been a member of the Pachman Terrace community since 2009. My husband died, and I was invited to, to attend. Um, and I've attended the award ceremonies for decades. Every year, as I read the brief program notes that introduce the featured awardee, and then scan the following one or two sentence histories of the past recipients, I wish there was more information on them. And I want to know more about the 50 heroes who have dedicated their lives to peace, freedom, and justice. Though many Pachman Terrace laureates are famous, JFK, Dr. King, Dorothy Day, St. Uh, Teresa of Calcutta, many more not famous, and yet all were extraordinary. Originally, I envisioned a reference book, a notebook, but this proved impractical, too cumbersome, too expensive. It made more sense to establish a website that could be updated and easily accessible. So last year, with the encouragement of the Pachman Terrace Committee, Blessing of Bishop Singula, a generous donation from Tom Higgins. Don't tell him I told you. Um, Dan Eagner's extensive network and help. I established a dedicated website, the Diocesan Satellite, to flesh out the unique and inspiring stories of these peace heroes from one to two sentences in the programs to two to three pages on the website. So not books, but you know, more substantial. The web scaffolding is in place, and we are gradually adding the biographies. I hope to make these biographies even easier to access with cross-referencing and to enhance peace and justice research with extensive bibliographies, which are in the works. I hope you'll check this out. As it stands right now, you can go to hotchamandterrace.squarespace.com, all run together. I'll say it again, hotchamandterrace.com. 
www.sports.squarespace.com and the password Hawks P A X. Yeah, but it's not. You got it? Yeah. I'll be looking at Tom Schwarzenegger pretty soon. You will. Thank you so much. I'm going to put some, by the way, Father uh, Jack Smith wrote the only text I know, the history of, of nonviolence in America gets right there. I think that's the first copy. Annika has it, and it's available at the archives, St. Ambrose archives. It's awesome. If I had known 10 years ago, Ted, I would have used that for the text. Most nonviolent texts have a um, compendium of article, and they're really good now. But nobody took uh, from the Mennonites off the Carolina coast teaching slaves in 1650. Come on, there's a nonviolent way of doing things that we just get so fascinated with guns. Don't get me started. Okay. Uh, but, okay. So, uh, God, look, there's Jack Smith's um, uh, history of Nama. And the one, the book on the far side is Father uh, George McDaniel, who wanted to but couldn't be here. This is a footnote to his work, The History of St. Ambrose. We should put like chapter 10 this. You know, okay, let's keep going, you guys. Here, um, I'm, I'm going to continue with some of the priests there. Dust, uh, three of those priests that he talked about were veterans, had done things in World War II. Dawson was in the Pacific. Uh, when he got out in the ocean, the war ended, so he just helped get boats back in. Okay, you can kind of glass about that. Now, here goes Father Strathman was at D-Day. He was a medium-sized bomber, uh, and he bombed the Normandy beach at 6 a.m. that the Nazi heads, uh, and then he went back at 1, 8, 1 p.m. and bombed the Nazis that were escaping into France. You ready for this? So he was in World War II big time. He went back to uh, Dresden after the war, and he saw that we just annihilated a city, a whole city. And he and I used to have, he lived next to me at, at a case hall over here. We had Manhattans and whatever, you know, just talking. When war stuff came on, he would talk about it. And then he said this, he said, we can't do that. That's revenge. We want to stop Hitler. We want to stop the aggression. Okay. We can't, you annihilate a whole city of persons in the city in the ashes. That's what we did. So he became, uh, uh, like you were saying, uh, the chaplain here, very spiritual guy. I love this picture. Chuck um, uh, Adams got this picture and hung it up, but it's, it's a, a strapping praying as a chaplain here. And he became a very strong advocate for nonviolence. Okay, that's my best story. Um, I just think he was just super. And, uh, you know, he had fought the fight and then came back and fought the fight for peace. Okay, Father Frank Duncan. He was a history prop. I'm surprised I would, when I read through George's thing, of course, he's a history teacher. Historians have been just about as much as philosophers and theologians here on campus to promote peace. And then uh, Father Frank Duncan went to Selma number two. Here's how I know. I invited Father Modit to come to the peace class when we did um, Martin Luther King. We read the Davenport lecture right over here at the old Masonic Temple when Martin Luther King spoke in 64 or 65. <laughs> then we sent down the priests and, and uh, uh, some students to uh, Selma number two, which was to march so that Blacks wouldn't have to take humongous tests just to register to vote. Three marches, two of them were unsuccessful. They were stopped by militant people at the bridges, and uh, the second one had escorts of priests and nuns. You can Google this up on Channel 11 in Chicago and see all the history. Uh, but what a, a, a beautiful thing that our Frank Duncan from up here, oh yeah, he's up there. There he is, I think that's him. I got somebody else, but uh, whatever. 
or to the archives? Is that we'll go to the archives, yeah, right down to. Uh, so he did march. Then Father Mata called Martin Luther King. This is to get to a bunch of materials here. Called Martin Luther King and said, you know, we want you to come and speak on civil rights in Davin for 1964 or five. And Martin Luther King says, we hear there's a flood. There's the biggest flood in, in uh, Davenport's history. Maybe it was 63, I forget. Okay. And then uh, he, Martin Luther King says, well, we, had, we hear you have a flood there. You worry about teaching us civil rights, we'll worry about the flood. They're going to come in on 2nd Street, and you'll be just fine, and he came. And the Gottlieb, the, rich, the, uh, the generous Jewish people, gave us that whole long gun, sat right next to him as Martin Luther King talked, and turned to Mark Bonnet and said he could preach the nails out of the floor. He became a large donor to St. Ambrose, partly moved by what we did with Pontium and Terrace. Big Martin Luther King here. Okay, are we getting pretty good time like Great. There we go. Uh, yeah, that's Father Bill, Frank Duncan. Uh, so let's let's go to the present here. Um uh, I don't know what there's so much happening. I am so proud of uh Mara Adams and Jesse and Royce in here. And but I want to do two things, and that is tell you about the two. I became, besides a teacher of non uh, pizza nonviolence course, I didn't think I was this, but I was, and I became this. Raise some funds. People don't just throw out money for peace studies, they throw out money for guns and training warriors, a trillion dollars a year. So we have to get it. So, two stories. I'm at Notre Dame game here. And we're probably winning those years like we're not right now. Okay, and football. Yeah, okay. I don't know. The lacrosse winning? Are they doing pretty good? But, okay, the lacrosse is doing good. And bowling, we beat Notre Dame three times in bowling. <laughs> I know you don't want this in the tape, but that's not. Okay. Uh, so, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, I got to be good friends with the Wilbur family. Um, they were in Catholic Worker. Chuck wrote the bishop's history. Uh, 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 on, on economic justice for all. He was basically the great ghost right? Head of economics at Notre Dame. For two years, head of the Croc Center for Peace at Notre Dame. And, uh, it's here. Yeah, he has to talk about, but we can, we can jump ahead to the Wilbur. We'll get to the two. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's the end of the Croc stuff, where is it? <laughs> no, you're right. I gotta finish this, okay. So I'm sitting at Wilbur's one time, good friends, good buddies. I help a Catholic worker house. And then uh, Chuck says, you know, my mom died last January. I says, you know, I'm sorry. And I, 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 he says, why don't you make Mariana Manhattan? His wife and I love Manhattan. So, okay, so I went and made Mariana in Manhattan. We had a Manhattan. He said, you know, my, my mom left a lot in her will. We want to give 10 grand to St. Ambrose to start a peace institute. What do you think of that? Another Manhattan. I mean, that was a joke. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> Anyhow, so when the check came to uh, our general funds, it was $20,000. So the Wilbur Symposium gets $1,000 a year, $1,500 a year for a, a, a major speaker and um, a student to write the best paper resolving one of the conflicts in the world using nonviolent means. Three hundred dollars to the student, a thousand dollars to the speaker. Jesse was spoke. Jesse and Mara. We did a study on Thomas Merton as a study group, and we had that. Uh, the the teacher, the one who did children and Rachel. not Rachel Sirens did children and nonviolence. Let's start in kindergarten. They're already kind of like bugged out by having lots of guns and weaponry and. And the military has so much money to spend influencing people to go that route. So, uh, so great job, love, Rachel. Okay, so then the second, let me, uh, okay, so then we started the Wilbur Symposium here. And then I came back, I went to the Croc Center at Notre Dame, $64 million given by Joan Croc, McDonald's hamburgers to uh, Notre Dame. And um, I was at the uh, cocktails with. Uh, the priest, the Holy Cross priest, when I was out there, and uh, there were two bishops and Ted Hesper 
we're sitting there alone because all the priests were over there talking about them, right? So Ted Hesper goes like this. This, this is funny, you guys. Come on, Ted <laughs> Hesper going like this to me to sit down with two bishops and Ted Hesper. Okay, you know. So I said, Ted, up and saying to him, Oh, you know, the O'Connor brothers. We worked together for labor rights in the 40s and 50s. There's your O'Connor. Uh, Ted Hesper, and then I heard that Hesper had been out to San Diego University. He had spoken about peace and justice out there. Uh, Joan Crock, secretary, called him and said, "Can we, uh, Mrs. Crock, would like to see you, Father Hesper?" Well, I'm here at Notre Dame. She flies out there. There, Jeff walks into his office. How much has been given to Notre Dame at one time? He goes one seven million. She wrote, writes out a check. No, University of Notre Dame for Peace Studies, a Peace Institute, seven million dollars. A little on the check that has a little flower up there, you know. That's how it started when she died, sixty-four million dollars. It's now the largest peace center in the world. It's doctoral level peace studies, um, um, eight full professors, twenty-five scholarships every year. I think that's what we model some things on. So I came back and I said to Father Cochon. I was his executor at the time, Pope comes to it poorly. And I said, you know, we got to start something like the Crop Center. Anyhow, when the Wilbers came to the first Wilbur Symposium, Father Pope John said, bring him over for a drink. Once again, Manhattan. Okay. And then, so we had a drink with Wilbers. As the Wilbers were leaving his office to come down here for the first Wilbur lecture, was it you or was it Mara? Mara. Mara, Mara Adams. Pope John takes me by the arm. I'm changing my will. It used to go to his nephews. He gave some to his nephews of 1.1 million to St. Ambrose for the Coke John endowment for peace and justice. So I didn't want to be a money raiser. That's what we needed, and we still need. It doesn't come up automatically. Okay, I got to finish here with the, the, the uh, students. No, they're students. Yeah. Okay. I love it. I knew these students, except Joe Smith, I didn't know very well, but uh, Randy. Is that Dr. back there? It is. <laughs> now, if you're an alderman, now, are you changing things over there, Brock Island? There's one of our students. And I, I, uh, I took you, Dylan Drake Parker, over to uh, Tom, uh, the Bridge Parish in North Bettendorf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. John Vianney, and it, we stood there and talked about peace and all that at, at North Bettendorf. And uh, I was getting a little thing. And then Dylan says, You know, I started out being kind of a warrior. I went to warrior camps in the summertime way back when you were junior high or something. And he said, St. Ambrose really ruined me. <laughs> I've been never going to be for war again. And so he's an alderman now in West Rock Island, right? Is that right where you're at? They're not still shooting people as they go, are they? You know, like one of the things you tried to stop was one of those chases where they keep shooting the guy, whatever. Talk to them afterwards. You know, I wish we had beer and wine here today. Okay, so that, and then Randy Richards, God love him. I, he gave me gods of information, mostly about Joe Smith and about um, John Kiley. So uh, uh, I think there's two things. Yeah, there's Joe Smith. Does this guy look like a 60s guy? Oh, 70s, yeah. There and there's the uh, uh, federal building that you to protest at. Uh, okay, but if, I don't know Joe Smith, but John, God love him, became a conscientious objector. Is that up there? You have him. Look at that. In the middle. Of, by the way, most students don't know this. If another war happens and a draft happens, men and women will be will be forced. To go to war. And he became a conscientious objector. And I said 1970 or 71 or 72. I'm not going to do this. And then he did all kinds of things for the community. Um, you can read it in Randy's uh, summary thing that, and helping out uh, human beings here, you know. So, okay. Uh, what else do we have? Teach Thomas Merton. Um, oh yeah, Father Hesper. Father Hesper knew the uh, Connor brothers. I told him my first job came from 
I was on Father Bill O'Connor when I was a senior at Assumption and came to Father Bill O'Connor, who was the labor guy. I said, can you get me a job? He said, go over to the union, blah, 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 and I wanted you. All the, all the uh, jobs were taken by college kids and all. So I came back here and um, maintenance, who was, it? who was the head of maintenance? The Morrissey, so old man Morrissey. Oh, we gotta do this though first. No, so uh, so John Kiley and Randy Richards and um, uh, Joe Smith worked with the administration here when four students were shot, unarmed students were shot in 1970 at Kent State. Nine were injured. It was the Ohio National Guard that shot them. So Randy Richards, John Kiley, and Joe Smith worked with the administration here in solidarity with the students who were killed. They met the flagpole, which you saw before the old flagpole. And then what they did was worked out a plan where students could take the grade they had right then, or professors could give them work to finish for the grade they wanted. And we basically shut the school down in deference to or in solidarity with the innocents that got shot. So that was our students. Uh, I thought the most powerful thing to students. I mean, other things that happened too, but that's the, that was the uh, archive of, of what happened there. Okay, thank you a lot for that. Presently, uh, there's just so much happening here. Um, and I'm kind of impressed with you and Amara, or what's the, uh, the thing that you resolve conflict. So it, the mediation. Me, yeah, mediation is uh, the Quad City mediation. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, I do have a thing in my notes. I think I'm going to use it a sermon about Jesse and the Quad City mediation. What do you do with the bully on the bus? And it was remarkable getting the bully off the bus, talking to him and saying, you know, you have a lot of power here. We want you to try one thing. The kid that you've been picking on, we want you to go up and have him be part of your group. Can you do that? And the kid did it, didn't he? But I was up to him. And the, the uh, victim kid became part of the group of the bus. I mean, you can do this stuff. You don't just have to buy bigger pit bulls and guns to resolve conflict. You can do this. Okay, now let's see. On a big scale, you better model your life. Let's talk about modeling life. Come on. Oh, yeah, no, the, the rest of this now is, Dr. Kim, God love him. Most of my class for 29 years, I discovered about 10 years ago, most of my class is aiming toward the United Nations. When Louise Arbor got Milosevic in a police car, didn't send more bombs. Uh, got in, indicted for crimes against humanity. Even Russia backed off. They picked him up in a police car. And our president wanted to throw more bombs at him. Of course, that wouldn't work because he was a sly guy. And all that. So anyhow, the United Nations is what my course was heading toward. So I asked Dr. Kim if he'd speak for a few minutes um, on the United Nations as a piece of stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Father Brian, yeah. for this opportunity to talk about modern United Nations. And my name is Doug Kim. I am a professor of political science and faculty advisor of SAU Modern United Nations Society. And I also invited two uh, students in our leadership team, Megan and Daniel. So today we are going to have we have five minutes, right? So okay, seven. Seven. Okay. <laughs> so we are going to talk about what we have done in the past year and then try to kind of show you know what we have been doing and what that try to explain who we are and what, what kind of activities we do at St. Ambrose. Okay, cool. And we attend two national conferences. And what we do is that we simulate the major bodies of United Nations, such as 
international court of justice, such as General Assembly, such as United Nations Security Council. We talk about and we debate and we try to build a consensus about international affairs and global issues. As say that promise, we are also trying to provide some leadership role in terms of raising awareness of global issues. And last year, we began to learn more about United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And this was launched by UN in 2015. And these 17 goals are about, you know, end the poverty by climate change, enhance public health and well-being, and try to have better education for our kids. So our goal is to establish with the UN to establish these 17 different goals to, to make our life better by 2030. So we wanted to learn more about these SDGs and we established three different major events on campus. And this was the events. And this is when our students gathered as a group and we talked about what are the things that we can do at individual level in terms of achieving 17 different goals. We also hosted um, a rally in support of Ukraine after our second conference following the Russia's invasion. Um, in order to gather support, we hosted a rally and we walked around campus along with tabling we did in popular areas around campus where uh, there were QR codes where you could make donations and also letter writing campaigns. So one of the things that we ended up doing at this last conference, right? So we're assigned to be different nations, right? Represent them. We have to look into them, see what they're about. So when we get there, when we are trying to write resolutions to talk to others, it's based on what that country may do. And what ended up happening is while there is this tension going on between Russia and Ukraine and eventually a war, guess what the nations that we were assigned were? And that was Russia and Ukraine. Of course. And, and uh, personally, I was on the, on the Civil Rights Council and I was representing the Russian Federation. So what we are doing here is this, this is our outreach afterwards when we went out into the community. There's a church right over here across the street. Yeah, there we go. And what we did is we explained that, we explained what we did. Um, and we explained also to those people there exactly what was going on. We explained what the issues were, what remaining some factors that led up to it, and you know, either ways that can help or just understand what's going on. As far as what we did as law the United Nations is we tried to build that consensus, right? And we tried to put ourselves in a situation where we had to talk to other people who in theory rank other nations and work out a, you know a common way to deal with that issue. also um, hosted a summer camp over the summer where um, mostly professors children came and but it was open to the public schools of the quad cities and we had a bunch of very intelligent and awesome kids come out and we chose to focus on topics uh, with the civil war in Syria and they took it very very seriously and they loved it very much, but um, it's very fun to see younger kids get so excited about um, solving. Thank you. And can I just add one? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. And this is our mission as modern UN uh, society. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is our mission, and we are trying to disseminate the message of nonviolence. And Monday, October 24th, um, that is the United Nations Day. It was October 24, 1945, the UN Charter became effective officially. So modern UN is celebrating United Nations Day at the Bowen Center just right outside this building. There's a small red brick Bowen Center, 6.30. We are having potluck party, so please join us. We have free food. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much.
I told my students that I started teaching with a piece of chalk and a blackboard. So all this stuff is newfangled, right? To me. So a couple of them have helped me so much uh, how to get movies up going here. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's see. Uh, here, here did the spanning funds. Yeah, we did the funds. That's Wilbur and Coach okay. And then uh, and Oh, yeah, okay. So I learned by the grapevine here our president, whose husband is a vet, has gone to uh, John Vianney Parish over there and done some communication about building up a peace institute or consortium. Um, it, it, so I'm wonderful. Go. And then the other thing she's made, she's gone to uh, Clinton and work with the Clinton Franciscans who have always wanted to build a consortium for peace. So I think we're going to start something between Ambrose and Mount St. It used to be Mount St. Clair. Yeah, but they're such a neat, they're, they're neat now. They're Franciscan nuns, they're St. Francis, you know. So I think that in our near future is a building of a consortium with, uh, with the Clinton Franciscans. I think that's it, Jesse. Anything else out there? I think they could probably be something to bring us into the future, don't you think? Yeah, if you've got some questions, uh, just wait till after we sing, okay? <laughs> you bring up my guitar. You guys are going to help peace out here because Sheila Delury and I sang at the Take Five Coffee House at 15th and Harrison in 1966. Is that up there? No. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Over there, can you get those two pictures? <laughs> You'll have to be a lower key. It's so funny. We practiced this afternoon. I just came from physical therapy, and she was just going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick. Never take it a drink. Okay, and don't play the red lights. You got right. the other picture. Just if you put it down here, take it down. Take the picture. It's inside this. What's the word I want? Does everybody know Father Ross Epping? Anybody not know him? He's my relative somehow. My cousin married his great uncle. Sue Mitchell made it to John Epping. I'll just use the same paper. She made the actual music. And then behind there is another picture. 1966. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there we are. 1966. That's 19. That's 2012. 12. Sorry. We sang the same song, but this is 1966 at the coffee house. Okay. You come take a closer look later. You can't find me in there. Okay. Half the man I am now. Okay. And the other one was 2012. We got together with the other people and raised three thousand dollars for the student emergency fund, singing the same song. We could just keep singing it. So okay, here we go. Come gather us, people, wherever you belong. Accept that the waters surrounding you have drawn, and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If time and people is worth saving, then you better start swimming, or you'll sink like a song. The time they are okay. Come, senators and congressmen, we be easy for all. Don't, don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For the event of Kim's turn, you'll be the best of all. There's a Bible on the side of the It'll soon take your window and a
Thank you so much for joining in. God love you and peace.